You are listening to a podcast. Not just any podcast, but the 76th podcast of the Something On My Mind program. I am David. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's show. What we like to do is cover all things finance, and we like to mix in some offbeat topics so that we can all have a little fun out there in this world. And you can also catch us on all social media platforms, including Instagram and TikTok at SOMM.podcast. And you can follow us on Facebook using SOMM underscore podcast. If you want to submit a question to the show, go to somethingonmymind.net. All right, so what are we going to talk about this week? And our financial topic, this has to do with asset allocation. This is something that we get a big question about from our listeners, which is, how do I decide where to put my money? Like in what classes based on the things I want to do, based on my tolerance, based on my time horizon, things like that. So we're going to cover that to give you some insight of what you might want to do for your future. And for our topic at the end of the show, we started this last week. We're going to try it out amongst some other fun topics down the road. And this is would you rather, and it's going to be a question, scenario-based things, of would you rather do this or that, and it's a fun little exercise between the group. All right, cool. So now we are on to the round table, and I know that, um, you know, really going to wing this one from the hip, because usually one of us has something in our back pocket, but today, producer Justin is going to kick it off. So what's the deal with the bruise on your face? Yeah. Um, I punched him. Yep. People, Cindy, we were out Saturday night and people thought that Cindy was knocking me around for uh, talking too much or something because <laughs> it's really pronounced. If you're watching a video here, it's uh, pretty. Actually, the other night, it looked like I socked you or somebody. It's, it looked it might, like you were in a bar fight. My bottom lower left chin and it looks like kind of like a, a a triangle and it's really gotten darker since then. And I and the thing is, I hadn't shaved all week and, and then when I shaved, it appeared. <laughs> when, I, when I first when I first saw him, I saw him from far away. No, wait, I think I saw him on a Zoom call, and uh, I asked him, "Do you miss a spot shaving? Because it looked like it was like a piece of facial hair that, <laughs> that he didn't get when he, when he was except shaving. for he's all gray. His beard's all gray. So I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. wouldn't work. If I would have known. I probably would have just groomed it and not shaved. It was shaved. pretty extreme Saturday night. It would still. It's darker now. Well, basically. I had a wisdom tooth pulled last Wednesday, and uh, um, here's how, I think it was worse than most people because I was electrocuted when I was four, so I, I bit a cord, <laughs> so I have scar tissue in here, and so my mouth doesn't open as much, <laughs> and so they stick this rubber thing in there, and it extends it. You, so you you have to keep your jaw. It's like that standing. game. It's like that game people play. With oh, I've their... always wanted to play what that. What game is that? Where you put the thing and you have to keep your mouth open and talk. Basically, someone made a game with that dental tool. Yeah, and where, literally. Like, oh, really? You pull up words and you have to like say the word and people have to guess what word you're saying, but it's so hard to understand them. Because that's to be that honest, that's like what dentists do. They, the minute they put that in their mouth, in your mouth, they start, the they game. start talking to you. They start playing the game. They literally the do. It's like the game of the dental hygiene. I've had hygienists and like. Like, would you just stop talking? I can't answer you. Well, no, you. it's not like, don't ask me a question. They do. Just don't talk to me. I've had... Just... You know, the last time I went, she was doing that to me, but she would, like, pause and let me speak while she was, like, doing my dentist stuff. And it's like, honestly, can you just continue? I don't want to be here. Yeah, that I, that's it. I don't even want to be here, much less have this trivial conversation with you. About nothing. About it's always nothing. about them because they're the only ones who can, can talk. talk. <laughs> so it's like my kid's doing this. My Literally. Literally. How are you doing in there? Uh, uh, and then, I really and then they take the suction. <laughs> Dude, the last time I had it, they I had a cavity in one of my molars and they they had to they like were they were waterboarding me. Like literally. <laughs> like had they had to keep it like dry but then they had to like squirt water on it like prom like <laughs> abruptly and like a lot of it and she's like okay like unfortunately like it's gonna feel like you're drowning because the back of your throat is gonna pool with liquid no but, like, you just gotta bear with me here I, I swear to god like it actually felt like i could breathe out of my nose but it gave me the sensation that i couldn't like breathe. you're drowning it, it literally felt like i was drowning and she'd be like are you okay and i'm like <laughs> like her hand is in the back no of my i'm not okay there, there's one woman oh with a tool in my mouth and there's a dentist there's like 
like I was getting the cavity filled. So there's literally like two sets of hands in my mouth. Wait, and how big was this cavity? I was just well, literally was an assistant. It was my last mole. It was like the furthest back oh, molar I have. So it's just God. hard to reach. And the worst too is the saliva buildup. Oh. Where like you- you're going. <laughs> and it's like you you like you can't adjust it you can't swallow and if you try to you're like does it look weird that my whole interior yeah, mo- just like yeah. move <laughs> that you guys is ever worst. you guys ever like have tr- <laughs> maybe i'm exposing myself sometimes i have trouble with the suction thing and i end up like squirting <laughs> liquid out on my on my bib <laughs> and they're like okay no i swear to god there was one time i think i've had that a couple times but like how often does it happen? No, it was squirting out of your nose. You know, they, they no, know it was just one time. They're looking at each other and going, "We got a squirter." We. <laughs> so just, every time she'd go to put it in my mouth, I had too much liquid, so I went to go like close my mouth a little bit, would like dribble out before I. Out of take... your nose? No, no, she's out of my mouth. Oh, she's numb, or it's like. Oh, open. it wasn't even that. It was just. Oh my god! I couldn't do it. I swear. What's that wrong one with you? Appointment. It's never happened again. I just that one appointment. I swear I spit up on the bib like six, <laughs> six times. <laughs> that is hilarious. That's the worst. Well, to finish my little stories, the first one, he, he, the first one he put back. in there was so it hurt my mouth so bad that I raised my hand like you gotta adjust this, and he he put another one in. It was tolerable because I was starting to get the sweats, like I'm gonna pass out. Like you know, when I get stuck with needles. Yeah. Because they always never, they never find yeah, my it's vein. It's called a visceral response. They never find my vein in a certain with yeah. prior post or pre-surgery. They always let them fiddle around with Literally, it. Literally, I saw that happen to you with your foot surgery. I, they uh, walked in with the needle and you passed out. I was like, you were out. It wasn't the needle part. It was, it was the, the minute because they never, they always like, they're messing around in my vein because I never find the damn thing. But anyway, so that was tolerable. And then. um about halfway through it, I'm like, I raised my hand, like, dude, I can still feel this. Uh, so he shot me up again, but then he's in it right next to the tooth. So he's in the hard part of the tissue. And so my my face was, I mean, how big was it when post surgery? It was, it was big. It was like, it was, it was brutal. Did they have to stick you, like, did they have to numb you in your jaw? Because they, to when I got, That's like, the worst. when I got a molar removed, the one I was talking about before, they were like, we can. Oh no! It wasn't more. It was I had a cavity in my wisdom tooth. It was literally the the very last tooth. But they um they offered me a shot of the Novocaine, and they're like, "Well, we can do it in your jaw, and you won't feel a thing. But your whole half of your face is going to be numb for like a day and a half. Yeah, like, no, like from your jaw all the way up to your forehead. And I was like, uh, no, no. I'd rather feel pain than be numb in my face. But. Agree. All right. So to round out my story, um, I got numbed as I said. So they put that uh, tool on there that kind of goes around your teeth, and they actually get out a pair of pliers, and they start rocking left and right. Gnarly. Up and down, and you can hear the squeaking and the noise, right? And um, again, I finally got numbed, which is fine. But the noise is still there, and then I'm thinking, it's just that, eh, 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 eh. and the lady's like, did you bring your headphones? And I'm like, no, like, no one told me. So I just had to go through that it's and a terrible feeling it's um and you can feel all the pressure they're literally like on top of you pulling the he was, i will say he was really good he was a good guy second time there like he was yeah. a, he was a pro he was good he was taking his time not he wasn't being um he wasn't just yanking it out of there um but i have really long roots and I know this because uh, because of a prior wisdom tooth I got pulled out. I had it. Uh, the roots were so long I had a hole in my nasal cavity. Oh my god! Yeah, so I probably drink through a straw it would come right out of my cavity, <laughs> right, right into my mouth. <laughs> Just like on what's that movie? Oh, that's from um, Heartbreak. Kid. Heartbreak Kid. She had a deviated septum when I was younger, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, "Oh, that's really too bad." She goes, "No, I told you, I got to doing coke with kids at camp." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah. So anyway, um. With all of that being said, I just raked my jaw. And so I came home and for, especially even now it's still swollen for two or three days. It looked like I was in a boxing match and just got, I got a couple of jabs up there, right hook. And so. Don't lie. I really did punch you. That was a great story. Well, I will tell the cool thing is I got to eat some ice cream. I'm eating soft foods um, on the right only. I mean, it takes a while to heal. There's stitches in there. 
And so now I'm like playing with my tongue. No, okay. Is that why we ate chili tonight? Yeah. <laughs> soft co food. Soft cornbread. It's hard to it's hard to find soft foods. I, it is. I've been eating a lot of bananas and oranges, and the first couple of days, like, I barely opened. So this is when it's going to be like when he's really old. I just have to serve him up soft foods. Same to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, touche. So, anyway, that's why I look the way I look, but um, it's obviously not an improvement. <laughs> Well, you look great, Dave. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's cool though when you get banged up a little bit because you get you get some decent treatment for a day or two from the, the from the wife. So, all right, from, cool. Yeah. Yes. What was that? From the wife. From the wife. Well, I've I've definitely paid my dues taking care of Cindy for the last couple of years. So, um, jeez. Although we don't want these things to happen, I it's it, when it happens, it's nice to have a little you know TNA. A return. Or, um, yeah. I mean <laughs> R and R. Oops. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> that's not what I meant. <laughs> I'm sorry, but can you just <laughs> that wasn't even a Freudian slip. Love list. and affection. Oh my god. <laughs> well, maybe that's where my mind was. You meant TLC, tender what, love and care. Yeah, just I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm dying. You know, my br my brain picked the wrong file. <laughs> Listen, both help the situation. <laughs> oh, that's so not planned. All right, that was tasty. Sorry, right, let's uh, oh let's move gosh. on to the financial subjects of the week. And uh, today we're going to talk about asset allocation, <laughs> and this is what. Why um, can I not take that seriously right now? Well, I know, but um, speaking of assets. Uh, basically, uh, we get asked this question all the time from the people that we know, and it's a hard thing to answer about where am I going to put my money? And it, it, you know, if you're in the market, even if you're a novice, there are thousands of stocks and bonds and mutual funds to choose from. So when you're thinking about all the availability out there, along with maybe not great education on it, it can be very um, tough for people to comprehend. And even people who are seasoned or savvy investors they still can have trouble making decisions um, and also get burned once in a while. So that's a part of playing the market. So well, I think if you aren't working with a seasoned financial advisor and trying to do all of this on your own, you actually could potentially undercut your own ability to build wealth and your nest egg for retirement. So, so we always ask, what's the best thing can you do for yourself? And instead of stock picking, First, you should start by deciding what mix of stocks, bonds, and potentially mutual funds you want to hold. And this is called asset allocation. Allocation, what... key point, because allocation means you're moving it across many sectors, or if you own a mutual fund, many stocks, for example. So obviously, uh, if you don't think of it this way, you don't want your eggs in one basket. So when it comes to allocation, um, what you need to consider is um, using the right mentality to achieve your goals for success for your long-term investing. And so uh, it can be basically your, what you're doing here is balancing your risk between different types of investments, typically, which would be stocks, cash, fixed income vehicles like bonds or short duration funds, um, maybe real estate, like a REIT, even if you're in a fund or just a specific REIT or der derivatives like options or credit swaps. Now, options and credit swaps and even real estate investments might be a little bit advanced for people, but there are options out there that do that. And as you get more seasoned with it, then you can probably jump in more of those things a little bit. Um, but either way, all of these vehicles, um, they behave differently over time. Sometimes they're cyclical, for example. If a uh, housing market's really good, then a REIT might be a good, good option right now. The market's robust with all the cash of supply from M1 and M2. So basically, there uh, is a good market to invest in right now, and it's been like that for a while. So it all depends on many factors on top of that, such as interest rates. We had a pandemic that the market dropped 40%, and then in two months, it went back up again, and it's really been going north ever since, which is great. Um, we've had a financial crisis before in 2009. We've had flash crashes like in October of 2017 and 2015, and market rotations like where money gets shifted out of um, basically the FANG stocks this year, for example. Apple's been blowing away like record quarters in the stock market history, but it hasn't been keeping up, for example, with the broader market overall. So there are so many factors to consider. And I think some critics might say that this type or style of investing only returns middle of the road performance. But for most investors, they see it as the best protection against a major loss should things ever go amiss in any one investment class or subclass. And even, you know, why you asset or allocate 
across the board amongst those different types of investments is to, like you said, balance out the risk. So in any one major event, and I'd say most financial professionals see asset allocation as one of the most important decisions an investor can make. And in other words, what you choose in terms of stocks or bonds is actually secondary to the way you allocate your assets to high and low risk stocks, to shorten long-term bonds and to cash. All right, so let's look at it this way. What it comes down to for people is the risk versus return. So it's like a, maybe call it a risk return trade-off. It's like in the center of what really asset allocation is. And so risk versus return is your personal choice. So you have to do your homework and decide what you want to do. Um, for example, if you got, um, you know, someone invests in an international fund, well, there there can be very volatile. So if you want to take that risk, maybe you want to buy some crypto. There's over 10,000 types of crypto out there. So you know what you're getting into and obviously, the more you study things and you can understand what stuff is more conservative, basically meaning I might make less on conservativity, if you will, if that's a word, but you also are going to be more stable in your investment. If you get more risky, um, you could get, um, again, high returns, but if you stick around too long, you might get whacked or have to wait because you got whacked until you come back to center. So you have to really think about how you want to invest based on who you are. Well, and I think let's think about the crashes of 1929. 1981, 1987, and the more recent declines following the global financial crisis between 2007 uh, or 2007 to 2009. And then, of course, most recently, the pandemic last year. And these are just all examples of times when investing in only stocks with the highest potential return wasn't the most prudent plan of action because overall, it took the broad market about four and a half years to recover. So We've said this before, but if you were concentrated in high-risk stocks only, your nest egg would have taken long to recover. And if you had time on your side to write it out, maybe that was great. But what if you didn't? What if you were depending on that? What if you had everything invested in one high-risk stock um, investment? You might not have been able to ride that out. Or maybe the panic would set in. Well, a lot of people got nailed in the financial crisis uh, for example, I was at the automakers. Um, I got out a little bit, I guess, uh, before that. But for example, I knew a lot of people who were in, I'm not going to name the, the automaker, um, but they had all their eggs in one basket and the stock dropped very low. And those people were getting bought out um, early retirement and because um, the company had to, they were forced out. And then, hey, all my money is here now and I've lost a lot of what I had. Now I'm in screwed. I'm in a bad position. And the only thing they can do is either wait to get out and uh, meaning that the stock's going to recover to give them some some livable money, or um, they just capitulate and they sell on a panic, and then they can't make any money because they took it out. So that's what this whole really we're talking about here, again, is asset allocation. So basically, you know, if we look at it this way, what separates the greedy and the return-hungry investors from the ones with the best success over time is the ability to weigh the relationship between risk and return. And I think that exactly what Justin being on the show that he's mentioned a couple of times is, you know, he's 25 and the more he's been investing, I think he's taking more of that other approach saying on the show, right? You've said it before, like, you know, I've learned that maybe the long and steady is more uh, beneficial overall. It is. There's no arguing it. Like if you, if you're lucky enough to hit a home run before you hit, before you strike out a bunch, then like good on you. But good on how you. often, uh, how often do you hit the home run before you strike out a bunch? Not often. And knowing that we always say this, that the S&P since 1926 has an investment gain or a percentage gain of 10% on average. So the market's designed to go up. The market goes up. It always goes up. It just doesn't always go up in that line consistently. But by history, almost 100 years, um, call it um, five years short, 95 years, that's what you're getting. So that's not a bad bet if you put your money in there and let it grow. There's not a better probably betting vehicle, if you will, out there than that number. So, Cindy, what do you think here about um, the time horizon? Let well, me talk about this a little bit. That's kind of what it always goes back to is that you should invest or consider investing based on your time horizon, your liquidity needs, and your risk tolerance. So bottom line is if you're an investor with maybe a higher risk tolerance, you might have a bigger allocation in the stock. But if you can't, re if you can't remain invested through short-term fluctuations like these things that we've experienced of the bear market, 
you might want to consider cutting your exposure to equities. It just be, it it really does go back to do you need the money? Can you wait out a correction? Are you going to be forced to capitulate or sell because you can't afford to wait it out? And that's all what this what we're talking about is asset allocate asset allocation, spreading it out to not take any one major impact um, in any one area of the market. All right. So basically, if you're a new person, you're like, well, what do I do now? You could get a financial advisor. Um, if you don't have a lot of money to start with, you might not be taken on. You might have to get your own account or maybe you just have money in a, in a, a employer sponsored plan. Um, but you can, again, there's plenty of resources on the internet that don't cost you any money. So um, you can you can go there and get some forms and you know fill some things out and you know get a feel for what you may or may not want to do. Um, if you do have a financial advisor, that's that person's job as a fiduciary to uh, get your information, probably through a questionnaire, same kind of thing, and then that person will help you determine you know what would work with you and give you an investment style, um, a plan to work with. Especially as you're younger, that thing that can also change over time. So hopefully that relationship and the more you're in the game. With um, investing, the more you be should become more comfortable because you've seen you'll have history and understanding of markets where your money's growing. Are you meeting the goals that was set out for you? Things like that, and that's the kind of thing that um, you can build upon. So and that's what I was going to say. Keep in mind that no two people are alike, and so much of the, you know, in the financial world, it really is based on your goals, and no goals are exactly the same. So you shouldn't put yourself in a box if you're working with someone. It's not it's not going to be the same as the person next door or the person sitting in the same room with you. So and when you're young, I mean, just saving when you're young, you have to start out. You should start out saving. You know, frankly, the minute you have your first real job, you should figure out how to budget and to pay yourself first. That's what we always say. Um, but you don't know what your goal. If I'm 21 or 25, I'm not thinking 65. But what you should be thinking is savings towards a goal at some point in the future, that's all going to change over time as life changes, your goals completely change. I always say this, this, it's never too early to invest. If you start doing it uh, when you're young, it starts building confidence. Success breeds confidence. It never fails. And maybe over, like Justin said a couple of shows ago that he had $4,000 in his IRA, but chucking just his monthly payment in there and it adds up over time. And then that feels good and you want to keep doing that, uh, performing that habit, if you will. So um, basically, uh, and this always gets down to what we say, but, um, you know, you should technically, you know, by our opinion, not allocate more to the stock market than you're willing to take on. Meaning I got to assess my risk and my time horizon, you know, what are my goals over time to get us to a certain amount? And that's, again, what you can figure out on the internet or through a financial advisor, like how to get to my million dollars. Like another example, I remember Justin bringing it up. We talked about how to make a million dollars the hard way, which is a joke because it's actually the easiest way to do it, which is a hundred dollars over 50 years at 7% gets you a million dollars. That's just a hundred dollars a month. It does add up. So it's not like the numbers aren't there. You just have to be willing to think about um, how I want to go about doing that. The other thing that we say you have to consider is that if you need any portion of that investment exposure, you just need to know that if something does happen in the market and it takes a big turn, then just be cautious when you're allocating your money that you don't need or you don't want to be forced to sell at the wrong time of the market. So another thing that we we talk about all the time is what is our goal? And, you know, we're working and we're saving our money and we pay our bills. And so everything that we do, we might allocate a little bit riskier. And when I say risky, I mean exposure to the market. We don't invest in high risk stocks. But I think that that's just another thing that, you know, whether you want to build out a meaty retirement fund or own a fast red convertible like me, or maybe a vacation home or pay for your kid's education, you just need to consider all of this in your asset, alloca asset allocation plan. It's like when you make a budget, if you need an emergency fund, a rainy day fund, savings, um, and part of that plan should be having money exposed to the market every month because you need to build a nest egg. So it's like, it's the shell. It's the same thing. You have to create a shell, fill in those pieces so you can determine how you want to make this broader plan. And then if you do well, um, maybe you get a bonus or some raises or your career expands, you're going to have more money down the road. And if you make good decisions, you're going to have more money to keep putting into that. And that's how you keep building that. But that's that mentality again, because when you get money, you get confidence. 
And so it allows you to get options in life to make good decisions. So for example, you know, kind of jumping on you a little bit, um, and, and your point was that it, let's say if you want to own a retirement condo in, in 20 years in the beach, then, you know, that's a good goal to look at because it's going to um, help you make better decisions because that's something you need to save for, but that's also um, discipline. Now, you know, if you have a, uh, let's look at it this way. If you have a child who's entering college in five to six years, um, maybe you say, well, I need to tilt my asset allocation towards that a little bit to have some money there for that. So that's another piece too, by the way, if you're, um, if you're, uh, young or young, meaning with your kids, um, as soon as you start saving the better. And so I started putting away money for Chase before he was born because I knew I was going to have a kid. So that's something also I put in my purview to make sure I put into my scoping. So these are the things you have to look at, but that's why you have goals because you know, goals are how you make decisions. You usually don't meet goals without having them set. They don't just happen by accident. So. Well, and I think to your point, if you're 20 years out of saving for a condo on the beach, then you theoretically wouldn't have to worry about any short-term fluctuations. It's that kid that's going off to college in five to six years that you have to be a little bit more safer invested. So like you said, tilt the allocation to something that isn't going to fluctuate so much over the th next maybe four or five, six years that you might need to tap into that or you plan to tap into that. Again, and this way it goes back to always starting early as possible, even though you might not be thinking about retirement at 65 when you're 22. Because uh, Cindy pulled up a nice stat here, but basically from the U.S. Department of Labor says that for every 10 years that you delay saving for retirement or some other short or long-term goal, rather, uh, you have to save is three much, let me say it this way, you have to save three times as much each month to catch up for that 10 years that you miss. So that's kind of like the rule of 72 backwards. You can't, and so you, and you know, I, no one can make up for lost time. So. I mean, I always say it's not too late to start investing, but it's certainly never too early to start in, in investing or saving. And I think a lot of modern day investors like younger millennials, Gen Zers, don't really always subscribe to this methodology. We've talked to plenty of people that really focus on more passive approaches to earning and building wealth long term and doesn't always include this very standardized or traditional way of investing. But, you know, if you do that traditional way of investing by different asset allocation, having time in the market not only allows you to take advantage of compounding and time value of money, but it means you can potentially put more of your portfolio into higher risk or return investments and, you know, potentially take on more exposure of a safer stock portfolio, something more tied to like the S&P that is just basic, you know, the, the steady eddies of the world. Well, this is why we always say, I said this last week on the show, was that when you are good with your money, it gives you options. So if you have some cash around, when the, when the pandemic went 40% down in the market, if you're a seasoned investor or even not, but really looked at history and learned, do you think the stock market is going to stay down at 40%? And more than likely, especially if you're just getting to a family or you're young, you don't, you're not, the goal is you not to have that money. Your goal is to build that money. So if you have something to play with, you can get things cheaper. You can buy new investments cheaper. That's why, that's how people become wealthy because they win at the game or they win at business because they jump on opportunities in life when things are down. The best time to actually buy, regardless of dollar cost averaging, but simplicity with math, when the market's down, no one loves it. But when the market's down, I absolutely love it because I know I'm going to make way more money because I'm getting in on opportunity because I'm buying things on sale. So that's why, you know, overall, always have a balanced portfolio no matter what. But, you know, you need to determine the right mix of stocks, bonds, and other investments. And you, again, you have to do a little bit of homework. You do have to pay attention a little bit, just like manage your money as you, with your budget. You can't just um, let it go south, but you don't have to look at it every day either because this is a long haul. This is a long game. So something to keep in mind. But again, I think once you get into it and start having a few bucks in the bank, um, you start changing your outlook and you, um, you give it the right attention that it needs. Well, and you, you use the word always. So I don't like the word always because that kind of gives advice that we're, we're not giving advice. It is always, so, it is always over time. It, it, just let's, let's clarify here. When I say always, it, like when I said, like the stock market since 1926, the S&P 500, it always goes up. It always has. However, it doesn't mean it does it every year. It doesn't just No, you said always should be allocated in a balanced approach. I don't, oh. I just want to say there's no single solution for 
allocating your assets. Oh, so well. every individual investor requires an individual solution. If so I, that's also well, the market I, I, doesn't always go up. It has gone up right. since 1929, but the market does go down. It just always. Yeah. So there. I mean, I I just want to absolutely disclaim that we're not we're not making predictions. We're not telling you what to do. We're not saying that this is always in any one case. This is if you look at your overall investment goals, just picking the right asset allocation for you is just a critical piece to the success in the long run. You should work with a financial advisor or read everything out there on the internet that you can about what is the right asset allocation. And further to that, just pick any you know site that gives you a risk tolerance questionnaire and on the internet you can find anything relative to what your risk is and that's really based on what do you have in the bank what have you saved for the long term what are you putting away for maybe 401k or in your investment savings um and that's that's going to sort of spit out what your tolerance for risk is and there's there's questions out there you're advisor can ask you too to to determine yeah, that so just so, to clarify when i say always i'm just talking about the broader markets as as an index or indexes they over time by history they do will they go up every year absolutely not that's that's all i meant by so if i i threw something out there that well, was, i think you said you should always diversify and, and allocate your portfolio in a certain way i'm just saying we're no. giving the tools and the information. No, I don't. We're not telling anybody think that. what I just to think, do. Like you said, it's all about the way you want to do it based on what you know your um, plan is. That's all. But I, I think you know the the bottom line. It's never too late to get started. It's never too late to give your current portfolio a a, a look again because things do change over time. Your income changes. Your maybe marital or single life situation changes. You have kids, you have different goals, your goals change, you're accumulating wealth. Um, so that's just something you want to just continuously be aware of over time is are you allocated in a way that you're going to get to your goal? All right. I think we've hammered that point home pretty good. So do your homework. I think we've pulled that tooth enough. We pulled that tooth enough. <laughs> Lots of noise there. So it's all good. Just... Jeez, you know, that's why we do this show. We just want to give information that you can use. But if you get in the game and you do it right, typically you should come out ahead. That's quality results and effort usually, you know, yield quality results. I have one last question. Yeah. When you got your tooth pulled, did you say, I am Root? <laughs> I am what? Root. Uh, Instead of I am Groot, you said you had these long roots. Um, I, I had to make a bad dad joke at the end. Yep, that's back to that progressive commercial about <laughs> turning out to be your parents. Oh, right? that's a done deal, dude. You know, he's asking in what kind of fish that noticed. is in the pond. He says, I don't know. He says, don't be coy. Yeah. I, I see you look, you're laughing. I would totally do that. You're you're proving the point. Well, I guess uh, I guess I got to think about hanging out with you in the long term. So I'll, <laughs> I'll do some planning. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's going to end our financial topic of the week. And we're going to get on to a subject that we did last week's podcast. I'm going to try it again for a couple of weeks, see how it goes, have a little fun. And this one is, would you rather? So we're going to take some questions and it's basically go around the room here and see what people think about these random selections. I actually really like this. All right. So you wanted to do number four on this list. And so it says, would you rather be forced to sing along or dance to every single song you hear? We know my answer. Well, you can't sing. <laughs> That's why my answer is dance. So actually, Cindy. Um, so I literally can't sing. I'm it, taking zero offense It's almost to like she's statement. doing it on purpose just, to, be just that, can't either. to be that bad. But so depending on the song, if I like it too in the car, I just keep increasing the volume. <laughs> If you've not noticed, would you, do you have to dance for the whole song or do you just have to like, I literally would dance to, oh, I would dance all day long. If I have to dance to the whole like song, wiggle? is it just, is it like no, pull I, out? Like, do I have to really like choreograph something to this whole song or like, do I just get to like shimmy my body a little bit and then like, be can like, you, all right, sh I can you shimmy? Can't we all? <laughs> um, I would sing along. I, I, Although I do love singing. This I is love about it. what you. This isn't about what you love. This is about oh, if what you're you forced. Hate, well, yeah, what you don't want, like, which is not as bad. I think you'd get pretty tired after a while, so I don't think I'd choose the dancing. I would. I would dance all day, every day. 
David, I know what you would answer. Um, I'm a little stiff, but you know, the Tin Man got some oil eventually and he was good. Um, all right, you wanted to do number 30, which is Gosh. would you rather have BO or not know it or always smell BO on everyone else? So again, would you rather stink and not know it or smell everybody else who stinks? Smell everyone else. Really? Dude, I do not. Oh, because then everybody would I be like. I do not want to be. You don't want to be that one? Behind closed door smelly person. Like who people are like, oh, did you smell Justin today? You smell like shit. Like always. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. That's like smelling like BO around people. Like you, you have to make it known to people or else you're just, they will make fun of you. So. I'd rather smell everyone else's. Hey, everybody. Forgot my deodorant today. Oh, my God. <laughs> he did. Justin See? came upstairs saying, does anybody have an extra deodorant? I, that happened to me at the... There has been times, and I you're like, the oh, office my... Time. Yes. I went to the to work one time, two two times in one week, actually, <laughs> um, and forgot to put deodorant on both times, and I got to the point, you know, midday, that I was, like, smelly, like, definitely smelly, and I had to... I just vocally made it known to anybody who walked in my office that I didn't put deodorant on today <laughs> and that I'm smelly so that they couldn't talk about it behind my back. That is so smart. Because Bring it right do, to the I've forefront. Already, like, I know I stink. I've already talked about it. Anything yep. you say, I've already admitted. There's nothing you can do to uh, harm my feelings at this point. So That's happened to me at work. And I'm like... I smell and people are like, no, you don't. I'm like, yes, I do. I know don't if me. I can smell it, I know you can smell it because typically we get used to our own smell after a while. So what I did is I, <laughs> I brought a stick of deodorant to work and that's, kept it in my desk. That's what I was just going to say. Why I do. That's what I do. Just so that if Why there was the off chance that I forgot. I started like dispersing all my toiletries. Like there's a bottle of cologne in my car and yeah. also on my dresser. <laughs> there's like, you know, make sure that if you ever forget, you got a backup. I used to bring my toothbrush. A lot of people do that. Yeah, so you just you bring a little dot. It's called a dop kit. For, so, yeah. For so man. would you rather be smelly and not know it or always smell beyond somebody else? I think I'd rather smell it because I don't want to be like the stinky guy. And, and but yet I'm the stinky guy. Don't know it. Cause then no one want to hang around me. That's even worse. Like, uh, I, there was a like kid pig? in my middle school who was the smelly kid who didn't know it. He was smelly from uh, geez, from elementary school. It's on, like but, like pig pen on Charlie Brown. Yeah, not good. And, and trust me, like that kid, like got. I don't. I hate to say he got like made fun of, but like, uh, he, like, people like, bullied him for being people smelly. People are cruel. And, like, I don't yeah. think he knew until he actually got like bullied. Yeah, I heard someone like say no, some like, mean was, stuff. People are there were, like kids in elementary school. There's always like one in every class, and it's like we all know you're smelly. We all mean to you because you're smelly. Can you fix it? I don't want to sit next to you and rub hand sanitizer all over my desk, the scented hand sanitizer, so I can get rid of the smell. Like, can you please fix it? To go off of the fixing it, that the kid who bullied the smelly kid, literally, I heard him on the bus. He leaned over the seat right behind him, and he said, he just looked at me and said, you smell like shit. No. And again, I felt so, so, I felt so cruel bad. So and awful. Mean. So I guess let's look at it this wait, way. Wait, hold on, but then he said, oh, oh, sorry. he didn't, that was not all he said. He said, did you ever think of showering or at least putting Febreze on you? Oh. And I just remember feeling like so, so bad. bad for this kid. But I'm like, you have been smelly for like seven years. <laughs> like you've smelled since I met you in third grade. Really? And it is now eighth grade. So let's get that. Maybe he had extenuating circumstances at home. That didn't allow him not to be that. smelly. Well, then he, they didn't have the odor because the house burned down. You have to consider that maybe... He had, you know. Listen, I wasn't the one making fun of him. I know, him. I, but I felt like, bad. I mean, that's the sad thing. Oh, like, maybe he had poor living here's the conditions. Deal. That was, that's what I was trying to get to is how do you approach that? Is someone going to come up and be able to talk to him? It's like the bad he breath used to thing. Also, like, take his pencil and pick the dirt out from underneath his fingernails. So oh. It's like, is it the situation oh, or is it the kid? That's like, so is he. Bad. Is he gross and dirty and, like, just I doesn't think he shower? had bad living conditions. I mean, I. I well, I hope they've gotten better, and I felt bad, and I hope he's no one bullies kids for being smelly. Yeah, boy. I thought we were trying to stay on positive <laughs> topics here. <laughs> this is a positive lesson. Don't bully people. Don't bully anybody. They have extenuating circumstances. All right, let's whip one more out here, really quick. 
Would you rather have a third nipple or an extra toe? I have a third nipple. And I also so do have I. a third nipple. And so do I. <laughs> I think like I think it's like pretty that, common. Well, because people think it's like a full nipple. Honestly, if a... you look at mine though, like if you look close up, there's like for sure like an areola and like oh a nipple on it. I'll show yeah, you but after. Still the size the of like a, it's still the size of like a mole though. A little bigger yeah. than that, I hope it grows. Oh my You know God. why that is for men? Because men start out as female and sometimes they just don't dissipate. It's along the milk line. It's around the milk line. Oh my gosh. So I didn't know either until I went to like actually it was the urologist years ago for you know, and uh, he's like, you got an extra nipple here. Yeah, it's in your belly button. It's in my belly button. <laughs> it's, it doesn't look right. My nipple is my, my nipple. Did you know my, that, you, know you that? guys? His third a, nipple is in, in my belly, belly button. button. That is gnarly. And it's brown. Why are we even doing this? I don't know. Now we just admitted a bunch of gross things about ourselves. Well... Maybe there's other. Third, we smell. We other, have third nipples. This is not right. There's other, other. Maybe there's other multi-nippled people listening to this right now, going, "Yeah, I, I know." You know what it is? It's our asset allocation. You know, I our did, assets allocation. Well, I did do this one thing one time to a nurse when Chase was born, and funny, she, you probably shouldn't say this. I, I looked at her third nipple. It was great. No. But she kept coming in, and I was getting annoyed because I couldn't sleep. And she's like, you got to feed him every two hours, and I'm following all the procedure, but I'm just so tired. And she kept coming in. I thought she was being overly annoying. And she goes, well, how's everything going? You know, after a while, I'm like, I go, everything is great except the sixth toe. And and she freaked and unswaddled him and looked at <laughs> him. And she's like, she's like, all right, I get your point. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I remember I just that just came in my mind. All right. Awesome. So we have talked about asset allocation um, or assetting more than one nipple on your body. And we've also talked about extra toes. And so um, and we've also talked about teeth. So a lot of body parts today. And so we hope you enjoyed the program. As a reminder, follow us on Instagram and TikTok at SOMM.podcast and Facebook using SOMM underscore podcast. And that'll leave it for the show for the week. So until then, until next time, I am David. 